Hi everyone, I'm Guille, and in this talk I will give you an overview of our work on tainted trichem, an adaptively and actively secure continuous group key agreement. I will start with our motivation, which is secure messaging, where parties that need not be online at the same time exchange messages by means of a server that buffers them and relays them to users as they come online. The two-party case has seen quite a lot of attention from the academic community, particularly since the inception of the double ratchet algorithm. So we can consider this setting well understood. However, the group setting is not as well understood. And accordingly, in this talk, I will give you an overview of a primitive called continuous group key agreement, which is, which is at the core of this secure group messaging uh, setting. Uh, I will present an instantiation of it, which we called tainted trichem, and I will discuss its efficiency and security. Let's start with what we would expect from a, a continuous group key agreement or from se secure group messaging. And the first thing we want is for it to be able to support dynamic membership. So we want to be able to add and remove users. Secondly, we want it to be asynchronous. So we don't want to make any assumptions on the online behavior of users. And third, we want it to be secure. We assume that some users will get corrupted throughout the protocol execution. And in this case, we want to ensure forward secrecy and post compromise security. So let me take just a second to, re to recall what these two notions are. So if we imagine a group timeline from its initialization, and we suppose there is some compromise window in the middle where the state of a user leaks, then forward secrecy would ensure that all the keys and messages up to some point in the past remain secure. Whereas post compromise security ensures that at some point in the past, in the future, after the end of the compromise, we will regain security. And of course, you can guess that both these notions need some form of key update functionality. However, the difference is that whereas for forward secrecy, one way that deterministic updates are enough, PCS needs new randomness infused. So going back for a second, we, we mentioned that, that we know how to build these groups in two-party case. So one could think that that this that uh, that one could build a group by just instantiating this bidirectional channels between every pair of users. And indeed, this works. The problem now is that if a user wants to update their keys, they need to communicate the new key to every single user, which of course has linear communication cost in the size of the group. And for very big groups, this makes it unfeasible. So to our requirements for a continuous group key agreement, we should add a fourth one, which is that key updates can be done uh, with, having, with efficient communication cost. And here, efficient by efficient, we mean logarithmic. And this is particularly important because the more frequently we can update, the better security we will get. This brings us to the message layer security, or MLS for short, which is an IETF working group looking to create a standard for secure group messaging. And in particular, the aim to support groups of up to 50,000 users. So of course, this efficient key updating that I mentioned before is, is very important. Their current proposal is called Trichem. So we will look at how this works. Trichem uses a binary tree where users are associated to the leaves. So each user has an associated leaf and each node in the tree has an associated secret public key pair. And the edges in this tree mean that the knowledge of the secret key of the source node implies the knowledge of the secret key of the sync node. So in particular, a user knows the secret keys on their path to the root. And indeed, it is this, the, the key associated to this root, also called the group key, that will later be used to derive keys that will be used to encrypt the text messages in the group. So everyone needs to have access to this and agree on it. Now let's see how one user could update their keys. So let's say Alice here belongs to this group of eight users and wants to update her keys. What she does first is she samples a new key for her leaf node and derives new keys along her path by means of a hash evaluation, signal here with a golden edge. These new keys, she then encrypts under the public key of the node in the code path so that all users now have access to the new keys in their path. So for example, if we take this third user here, they will have access to this secret node and therefore we'll be able to decrypt this ciphertext gaining access to this key and by evaluating the hash, gain access to the new group key. 
After this, the old keys are deleted. And what this achieves is that had Alice been corrupted before she updated, all the secrets that had leaked during that corruption to the adversary are now removed from the tree and therefore useless. So we have achieved PCS, as, as we mentioned before. The more interesting case, however, is removals. So let's say here that Alice wants to remove Henry, that it's the uh, uh, rightmost user. So intuitively, what she needs to do is, similarly to the update, she needs to rotate the keys of the nodes in Henry's bank, right? She could do this as before, just as we saw with the update. The issue here is that if it is Alice that samples these new keys, and if she was corrupted while doing so, then not, not only the keys on her path leak, but also the keys on Henry's path. So now if we were to remove Alice in the same way, the adversary will still have knowledge of this key here, and in particular would be able to decrypt the ciphertext and gain access to the new group key. And of course, this is not what we would expect. If we have a corrupt user and we remove them, we would expect to have security again. So how do we solve this? The approach that MLS takes is called blanking and effectively means that you delete the keys on the nodes of the path uh, of the remove party and then act, act as if those nodes don't exist and when you need to encrypt to this, so when you need to encrypt a new key for this node, for example, instead of encrypting it to this node that was on Henry's path that is now blank, you encrypt it to, to the nodes below. So to remove a party, uh, let's say Alice here, Alice will just create a new group key by just uh, generating effectively an update and deliver the new keys to the appropriate node in the code path, pretty much like we saw before. Uh, even though we are changing the tree structure, this is not uh, a terrible issue necessarily because as users in the appropriate subtree update, then the new keys the nodes that have been blanked will receive new keys. So we will regain our binary tree structure. The problem, however, is that if we do remove a lot of users, we will create a lot of blanks. And it could be that a given update, for example, this one from Alice here, needs to be encrypted individually to all the leaf nodes, which of course brings back this linear communication cost, which, which we were trying to avoid. As a potential solution to this, we, uh, we propose our, our protocol called Tainted Trichem, which is a CDK variant of Trichem that does not make use of blanking. In this work, we show that this is more efficient under some natural distributions of group operations. And furthermore, we prove it secure against adaptive adversaries that have full network control. In particular, our proof is the first adaptive proof for any CDK or Trichem related protocol that achieves polynomial laws. So let me give you an overview of how TTCAM differs from TRICAM. So recall the case before where Alice wants to remove Henry and we said that in, intuitively she needed to rotate the keys along Henry's path. So what we do in TTCAM is we do allow Alice to sample keys outside her own path, but these nodes now become tainted and they are public no and it is public knowledge that they are tainted. So everyone keeps track of who was the last person that sampled each node, who, who was each person that was not on, the, on, on that path that sampled that node. Later, if Alice needs to update and she has to tainted nodes, she will also be required to not only update her keys on her path, but also update the keys on, 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 on these tainted nodes. And similarly, if Alice was removed, not only her keys, the keys on her path would be removed, but also the ones for all tainted nodes by her. What this ensures is that all the keys that could potentially have been in her state or have leaked had she been corrupted are now changed. I uh, refer you to the paper to, for the full details of the protocol, but let me just give you an overview of the efficiency. So at first sight, it's not clear which of the two schemes might be more efficient because they affect, if they, they affect communication in a different way. So a blank will affect anyone whose code path contains the blank. So whenever I need to encrypt to a, to a blank node, I will still need to encrypt to more nodes. A taint, however, affects only the tainter since they are the only ones that will need to um, uh, will need to 
to rotate the key of that tainted node, but this is irrespective of their position in the tree. So irrespective of, of the relative position between a tainter and a tainted node. The second aspect, it's healing. So a blank can heal when a user in the appropriate subtree samples a new key for it. This condition, however, is not enough for tainting, which also requires that all its children have been untainted. So healing is slower in, in tainted tricking. Despite this, uh, in our comparison, in our uh, analysis, we will show that tainting uh, seems to come out on top on many scenarios, as we will see. However, the first hurdle that we find when trying to, to, to compare Trichem to, to Titicam is that Trichem, Trichem's recent version uses what is called the commit framework, where operations are bundled into batches and executed at once together with an update. So our protocol Titicam does not do this and instead executes operations one by one. So what we did is we compared Titicam TTCAM against two dummy variants of TRICAM against which this comparison is this year. The first one, TCAM in blue, with in blue in the, in the graphs in the following slides, ignores the update following each commit. So of course it will be more efficient than TRICAM since we're ignoring this extra work uh, incurred by every commit. The second one, TCAM commit, uh, restricts each commit to contain a single operation. So of course it will be less efficient than TRICAM since it cannot take advantage of, for example, bundling together several removes. We compare the two protocols in two different settings. The first one is that of no administrators, where we assume that adds and removes are performed by all users uniformly. And here we distinguish two cases, depending on whether the, the distribution uh, that represents how often users update is a SIP for a uniform. In both cases, however, we get similar results, uh, which show that TTCAM performs better uh, asymptotically. The second setting we consider is that where adds and removes are performed exclusively by a small set of administrators. And here we assume everyone updates with the same probability. The overall results are similar, TTCAM is still performing better asymptotically, but what's interesting about this case is that it highlights a trade-off between the cost for non-administrators on the left, which is much better for tainted trichem, versus the cost for administrators that now bear most of the load. Now, let me just mention a few words, uh, just uh, give a few words on security before finishing. So uh, to start, let me describe the adversarial model that we consider. So we consider an adversary that controls the protocol execution and can corrupt users adaptively. Moreover, uh, corruptions take place during a window during which all the user state leaks, as well as the randomness used well during this window. Third, the adversary is partially active, meaning that they have full network control and can force parties in to inconsistent states, but we do not allow them to, to craft messages. And since we assume implicit authentication, what this means is that they cannot corrupt the user and send messages in their name. And of course, security is defined in terms of a challenge where the adversary must distinguish a, group, a real group key from a random one. And we must ensure that this challenge is not trivially solvable from one of the corrupted keys. Uh, so we must define a safe predicate. Uh, as to the concrete results that we get, if Q is the number of operations that take place during the protocol execution and N is the number of users, we get that in the standard model, if uh, we have an encryption scheme that is uh, epsilon in CPA secure, and we model H, which is this function using the key derivation as an epsilon secure pseudo-random function, then TTCAM loses a factor of Q to the log N um, insecurity compared to the underlying encryption scheme. In the random oracle model, however, the result is better, where the factor is only polynomial, so Q squared and squared to the underlying encryption scheme. And the nice thing is that these results apply to TRICAM that at the moment of our work in, had no adaptive security proof <clears throat> with some exponential loss. So to summarize our results, we propose a new variant of TRICAM uh, based on tainting instead of blanking. We show it more efficient under natural distributions and we provide the first adaptive security proof for any CDK that only has polynomial loss.
Before finishing, just to outline a few open problems. So the first one would be, can we extend security to malicious insiders? The second one, are there more efficient protocols out there? So most of the approaches that we've seen so far are based on Trichem or variants of it. So maybe a completely new approach works. And the third one is, can we get a better efficiency comparison using real world access patterns, which we didn't have access to when we wrote this paper. And with that, I conclude my talk. And I thank you for your attention.